The purpose of life is to drink beer. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. God is truth. The sun is green. Trees are taller than grass. Spinach is better than Coca-Cola. You're pretty good. What do you think? Is there anyone able to present strong arguments that show that that's how it is? Now, listen to the following claims and see if you agree with any of them. We should lower the taxes. We should raise the taxes. We should ban abortion. We should legalize abortion. We have to raise the speed limits. We must lower the speed limits. If you agree or disagree with any of them, see if you still do if I expand them a bit. If we want crime rates to fall, we should lower the taxes. If we want to strengthen the economy, we should raise the taxes. If we want to increase the budget revenues, we should ban abortion. If we want to anger some people, we should legalize abortion. If you want to increase the gross domestic product, you have to raise the speed limits. If you want to protect the environment, you must lower the speed limits. Both groups of sentences contain prescriptive claims. Claims that suggest a course of action, what someone should do. But there is a significant difference between claims from the first group and claims from the second group. Claims from the first group do not say anything besides suggesting what someone should do. Claims from the second group are prescriptive conditional claims, which have the if-then structure. Actually, the claims in the second group have even more specific structure. If someone wants to achieve goal B, then this someone should execute action A. This specific type of claim includes three significant things. First, it acknowledges that actions are executed to achieve a specific goal, and it specifies that goal. Second, it acknowledges the simple fact, not everyone wants to achieve that goal. This is relevant in situations where there are multiple people or groups of people who want to achieve different goals and they can influence what goal will be adopted. An example of that kind of situation is democracy. Whatever goal you have, whatever goal you think people, society should adopt, there will be people with different goals, whether you like it or not. There will be difference in goals that stems from the difference in values, beliefs, attitudes, norms, preferences, likes, dislikes, and so on. Because this type of claim acknowledges this, I will call it pluralistic prescriptive conditional claim, or simpler democratic claim. Third, this type of claim contains something that I will call here claim that something is, or simply is a claim. Is claim basically is a claim spoken with an intent of saying how it is, not how it should be, but how it is. A claim, if someone wants to achieve goal B, then this someone should execute action A, contains an his claim A causes B. Examples of his claims are All roses are red. It is raining now. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Drugs are bad. Smoking causes cancer. His claim can be purely descriptive, like all roses are red, or normative, like drugs are bad, trying to state what is good or what is bad. In order for a claim to be considered an his claim, it doesn't have to actually say how it is. Only the intention of its author matters here. The fact that the author thinks that it says how it is. The job of the claim's author is to provide arguments in support of it. The fact that the democratic claim contains those three things is the reason why I've used it as a starting point of the method that I will describe here in this video. A method needs a name, so let's use the name of the channel and call it the stop and think method. It is a method of reasoning, of argumentation, of discovering if a claim made by someone or by yourself can be supported by strong or any arguments. A method that can help us to make the mess a bit less messy. How exactly it can help us to achieve this? There are several steps to it. To understand them, first we need to understand certain six philosophical terms. Take a look at these two claims. All triangles have three edges. It is raining now. The first one is a claim that is knowable a priori. Claim knowable a priori expresses knowledge that does not require experience and empirical evidence. Knowledge that can be achieved by reason alone, without the use of the senses. You do not need to verify with your senses that all triangles have three edges. The second claim is knowable a posteriori. Claim knowable a posteriori expresses knowledge that requires experience and empirical evidence. Knowledge that cannot be achieved by reason alone and requires the use of the senses. Learning that it is raining now requires experience. The first claim is analytic. Analytic claim is made true or false solely by the conventions of language. It is true because of its meaning, because of the meaning of the terms contained in it. 
The truth of the claim, all triangles have three edges, is derived from the fact that a triangle by definition has three edges. This claim is true by definition. Another example is 2 plus 2 equals 4. The truth of this claim comes from the meaning of the symbols 2, 4, plus, equals. The second claim is synthetic. Synthetic claims are true by how their meaning relates to the world. You are not able to derive from the meaning of the claim it is raining now, if it's actually raining now. Whether it is true depends on how it actually is in the world. The first claim contains necessary truth. Necessary truths are those that cannot be untrue in any situation. A negation of necessarily true claim is self-contradictory. The claim 1 plus 1 equals 2 contains necessary truth because 1 plus 1 always equals 2. The claim if A is smaller than B and B is smaller than C, then A is smaller than C contains necessary truth. Logical truths are necessarily true. They cannot be untrue in any situation. In philosophy, another way of describing necessary truth is that it's something that is true in every possible world. The word world is understood here as a whole universe. The second claim contains contingent truth. Contingent truth could have been different, could have been false. In our universe, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, but it could have been different. It is raining now, but it could have been different. The terms necessary and contingent are related to metaphysics, a study of reality, of what exists. The terms a priori and a posteriori are related to epistemology, a study of thought, belief, knowledge, of how we think about reality, of how we think about universe, and how we know what we know. The terms analytic and synthetic are related to language, to how we describe what we think and know. At first sight, it may seem that all claims can be either a priori analytic necessary or a posteriori synthetic contingent. It may seem that a true claim is either true by definition, is always true and known by reason, or it depends on how it is in the world, could have been different, and have to be verified by experience. But actually it is not that simple and obvious. Various philosophers proposed claims that cannot be so easily relegated to one of those two groups, and in a moment I will give some examples. But in practice, for the purposes of the method described here, the relations between those groups can be simplified. In practice, necessary contingent division is irrelevant, since we are living and operating within this universe. Properties of this universe are practically relevant to us, and that is what we discuss and agree or disagree on. We make his claims and we show that our his claim actually says how it is by providing arguments derived from reasoning or experience that show that the his claim is true because it says how it actually is in the world, or it is true because of the meaning of the terms contained in it. What really matters in practice is argumentation. It is with arguments that people convince others that what they claim is true, not by simply claiming that it is so because they think it is so. Everything revolves around judging how strongly the arguments support the claim. Now we will look at several examples of claims and how they can be supported by arguments. I've already presented examples of claims that are clearly analytic a priori. Claims like all triangles have three edges or 2 plus 2 equals 4. Claims of such kind are either certainly true or certainly false. One simply cannot reasonably disagree that all triangles have three edges. That's how it is. I've also presented examples of claims that are synthetic a posteriori. Claims like it is raining now. They are intended to say something about how it is in the universe and should be verified by testing them empirically. And there can be a reasonable disagreement about them. We do not have unlimited and flawless knowledge and understanding of everything that is in the universe, so the conclusions reached can be wrong and regularly are wrong. Even if arguments seem strong at the moment, then in the future it may turn out that the claim is wrong, as it regularly happens even in science. Let's look at another set of examples. I am here now. Every effect has a cause. What is, is. It is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. Space and time exist. Such claims may create some disagreements about how they should be categorized. For example, whether the knowledge about space and time is gained a priori or a posteriori. But in practice, it doesn't matter. I don't think you will find many debates about whether space or time exists conducted in the context of some practical issue. Water is H2O. This claim was proposed by Saul Kripke as necessary a posteriori. Necessary because water could never, in any possible world, be anything other than H2O. If something is not H2O, then it's not water. A posteriori, because it needs to be discovered empirically that water is H2O. But do you really need to discover that water is H2O? 
In practice, it depends on what precise meaning the speaker ascribes to those words and to the sentence. Which one of those pictures shows water? How many pictures of water do you see? The answer depends on the meaning of the words. If one thinks that H2O is the chemical compound made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and thinks that water is this liquid that is everywhere on planet Earth, then those terms have different meaning. And in this case, water actually isn't H2O, but it consists of H2O, and it needs to be discovered a posteriori that it is so. But if water is being used as just another name for the chemical compound H2O, then understanding of the terms water and H2O is enough to know that water is H2O. Another a bit different example is Asparus is Phosphorus. Or in other words, evening star is morning star. Evening star is the planet Venus visible in the evening. Morning star is also the planet Venus, but visible in the morning. Despite of them being the very same thing, it still needs to be discovered that evening star is morning star, since those names were given in different contexts. The length of a stick S at time t0 is 1 meter, a claim proposed by Sol Kripke as contingent a priori. A priori because nothing is being discovered here, but a decision is being made that the length of the stick S will define what 1 meter is. Contingent because the actual length of the stick S at time t0 could have been different. But is it synthetic or is it analytic? Let's assume that someone claims that one meter exists in the universe and its properties are independent of human opinion, that its length does not depend on what people think. Obviously this person would fail to prove that that's how it is, because one meter is a concept created by a human, who defined it and decided what it will refer to. So this claim is a definition that then can be used in analytical claims, like two meters are longer than one meter. It can be used if we know about it. But if we don't know the definition, then experience will be required to learn about it. For example, by reading about it in a book. The purpose of life is to drink alcohol, says Abam after emptying his bottle of vodka. Is he bubbling without sense, or is he a street philosopher who discovered a truth of the universe? If the latter, then how could he be able to provide arguments that would clearly show that that's how it is? Not how it should be, but how it is. Could he be able to show that that's how it is in the universe? Could he be able to show that in the universe there is such thing as the purpose of life and that it is an alcohol drinking? Could you be able to directly or indirectly observe it and discover its characteristics as we can do with other existing things and properties like, for example, trees, temperature, size and so on? If not, then maybe he could be able to show that understanding of the terms contained in the claim is enough to know that that's how it is. That would be the case if, for example, it was the adapted definition of the term purpose of life, so instead of saying drinking alcohol is forbidden here, you would be able to say purpose of life is forbidden here and everybody would know what you mean. If the author of the discussed claim is not able to do any of it, then he has no convincing arguments in support of it. Party morality is the highest level of ethical consciousness, said Julius Martov to Lenin in the sixth episode of the TV series Fall of Eagles. Could he be able to show that that's how it actually is? Could he be able to show that such thing like party morality can be discovered, described, measured, compared independently of human opinion, with methods that are not completely subjective? If not, then maybe he could be able to show that understanding of the terms contained in this claim is enough to know that that's how it is. Clearly not. We can create our own definition of party morality and insert in it our own judgment that it is the highest level of ethical consciousness, but no one is obliged to accept it. This claim could have been turned into one that says how it is by first specifying a standard of judgment, a scale that would arbitrarily decide which form of ethical consciousness is on which level, with party morality being on the highest level, and by that defining the meaning of the term the highest level of ethical consciousness. And second, by explicitly stating that this specific standard says that party morality is the highest level of ethical consciousness. For example, the claim to us party morality is the highest level of ethical consciousness states that our own standard says it. Which brings us to the wider issue of value judgments. Good, bad, right, wrong. How could you show that a claim containing such words is not just an opinion, but actually says how it is? Are you able to show that words like goodness or badness refer to specific property that exists in nature, in the universe, and by saying that some object is good, we are noting that this object has this property? Are you able to show that it doesn't depend on anyone's opinion, that you cannot decide that the object is good, but you can only perceive it? Because we are able to do that with physical properties. We are able to show that objects have velocity, length, mass, and so on, and specify their values. 
and we are able to do that by methods that are independent of opinion, that do not depend on fully subjective methods of judgment like, for example, intuition. Can you do that with goodness or badness? Because only then you would be able to show that the claim that a given object is good says how it is in the universe. Maybe you are able to show that understanding of the terms contained in the claim object X is good is enough to see that indeed that's how it is. Clearly the word good is not the definition or the synonym of whatever hides behind X. If you say this apple is good, then it doesn't mean that in sentences you can replace this apple with good or good with this apple. If we will look at how words like good, bad, wrong, right are used in practice in claims like object is good, then we can notice that basically they are functioning as a synonym of some other property. For example, object X is an apple, it's tasty, and we say apple is good, meaning that it's tasty. Here good means tasty. Or X is a person who is honest, and we say that because of this she is a good person. Here good is a synonym of honest. X is a comedy movie, it is funny, and because of this we say that it is a good movie. Good is being used as a synonym of funny. You can find out what property it is a synonym of by asking why. Apple is good, why? Because it's tasty. What we are doing here is we are assuming a standard of judgment, a scale that defines words good and bad by specifying what they actually mean when they are used to label a specific object. One scale defines what a good apple means, another defines what a good person means, yet another defines what a good comedy movie means. The reason why it's like I've described here is how we create standards that define the meaning of the words like good or bad in claims like X is good and X is bad. I'm claiming that behind reasons for the creation of a standard of judgment, a prescriptive claim is hiding at the moment of the standard's creation, even if it's not being realized by the person creating such standard. A claim that the object to which that standard is being applied to should be, should have, or should be doing something specific. If it fulfills this claim, then it's good, if not, then it's bad. So, good, bad, right, wrong are actually properties in themselves. Properties that say whether the given object fulfills some specific prescriptive claim. And since any given object always fulfills some prescriptive claims and doesn't fulfill some other prescriptive claims, then at the same moment both claims X is good and X is bad can be saying how it is, although they are not particularly informative. If you don't know what standard of judgment is being used, you don't know what good and bad mean in this particular context. You don't know why something is good or bad. One person might say that an apple is good because it's tasty. Another might say that the apple is bad because it has a wormhole. A more informative way of making value judgments would be to specify the properties that hide behind words good, bad, right, wrong. Like for example, this apple is bad because it has a wormhole, or simply this apple has a wormhole or to specify the standard of judgment, like for example, to me this is bad. In practice, prescriptive claims ascribed to objects are derived from one of the two things. One thing is personal preference. What we like, what we prefer, we might label as good. This applies to everyone, even a god, any god. The other thing is purpose. Words like good or bad are used to label things that serve or do not serve their purpose. Purpose of something usually is derived from its very definition. That is the case with things created by humans. They are created with a specific purpose in mind. A car that doesn't drive, a plane that doesn't fly, a knife that doesn't cut, those things will not be labeled as good, even if we do not care if those specific objects fulfill their purpose. A purpose can also be arbitrarily given to any object. If someone beats someone else with a randomly found stick, and this stick doesn't break, then he might say that this is a good stick. That's because it served its purpose given to it at the moment. Another interesting example is whether the answer to a question is right or wrong. If someone is being asked what is 2 plus 2 and answer is 5, then this answer will be labeled as wrong, because it's incorrect and it doesn't fulfill the claim that the answer to a question should be correct. But let's say that a torturer wants to break the will of his victim by forcing him to say things that are clearly false, asks him what is 2 plus 2, and he correctly answers 4. Then the torturer can shout wrong answer, because the purpose given by him to the expected answer was to break the victim. Value judgment based on a purpose creates disagreement much less often than judgment based on personal preferences. That's because the stated purpose of a thing usually becomes accepted. You don't see people claiming that the purpose of a knife should be to hammer nails. One reason is that things are designed to serve a specific purpose. 
Another reason is that the purpose of the thing does not force you to use it. If you don't intend to shoot people, then you will not say that the purpose of a gun should not be to shoot people, but to cut bread. And the gun itself, obviously, will not disagree with its purpose. That's different if someone tries to decide what your purpose is and convince you that you are bad because you are not fulfilling it. You may have a different opinion. An object with multiple purposes may be labeled as good and bad at the same time. You can say that a professional assassin is a bad man because he doesn't fulfill the claim that a man should not go around killing other people for money, but at the same time you can say that he is a good professional assassin if he effectively fulfills the claim made by his job description. So, even if there is such a thing in nature as objective goodness, I don't think it's related to how people use words like good, bad, right or wrong. Does all of it mean that we shouldn't judge standards used by others, because standards are a matter of opinion? Well, not exactly. First of all, I'm claiming that there is really no way of directly concluding should from it that would be based on some independent external binding force. The only way we clearly can do that is when should refers not to a goal, but to a method of reaching it. Basically, when should is contained within a pluralistic prescriptive conditional claim. If you want to achieve B, then you should do A. In this case, should is derived from is, but only as a method of reaching a goal. For example, if you don't want your hand to get wet, then you shouldn't put it in water. As experience shows, water makes unprotected hands wet. So, if you don't want to make your hand wet, then you shouldn't put it in water. Consider a different claim. Water makes hands wet, so you should not put your hand in it. The fact that water does that cannot really make an act of putting a hand into water impossible. You can still do that. But if you don't want your hand to get wet, then you should not put it in water, because it will get wet whether you want it or not. How does it look like in the context of language? Can one derive should from is based on the meaning of words? Let's say that a word runner refers to someone who is running at the specific moment. If you are not running at the moment, then you are not a runner. You cannot conclude from the definition a runner is someone who is running that you should be running right now. Additionally, concluding from the definition a runner is someone who is running that a runner should be running is redundant because a runner is running. But you can reasonably say that if you want to be a runner, then you should be running. This claim tells you what you should do to move from not being a runner to being a runner. It's an example of a more general claim. If you want to be labeled with a specific term, then you should fulfill its definition. The given definition of a runner specifies a state in which an object is when it's fulfilling the definition. A runner is running. But what about definitions that specify a purpose? What someone or something should do? It may seem, for example, that reasonably a watch should show time, because that is its purpose. But a watch that stops showing time does not stop being a watch. It's still a watch, but it may not be a good watch. So in this case, it's reasonable to say, if you want to label a bad watch as good watch, then you should fix it so it starts showing time. Also, if a good watch is a watch that is showing time, then, strictly speaking, it's redundant to say that a good watch should be showing time because a good watch is showing time. Another example. If you are working as a guard, then it's possible for you to not do your job and still be a guard. The binding force is only introduced here by an if. For example, if you don't want to lose your job, then you should be guarding what you are supposed to be guarding. All of it is even more visible in the case of someone who is given a purpose that they doesn't agree with. Are you bound to do something only because somebody said so, even if you don't agree with it? Or maybe any binding force is only introduced by an if. For example, if you don't want to suffer the consequences, then you should do this. So you can move from is to should only on your way towards a goal, to another desired is. Should is a road between two instances of is. Outside of it, there is really nothing that physically or logically binds one to do something because some other thing is. Obviously, one can simply say that you should do something specific. But this will be only an opinion, a recommendation. Even in the cases that seem obvious and reasonable, like in the case of a watch that should be showing time. So reasonably, you cannot simply say, without specifying why, that because standards are a matter of opinion, then we should not judge standards used by others. That's one argument. Another one is that there are criteria of judgment based on things that are common to most people. Those based on features of human biology and psychology, like senses, pleasure, pain. There are virtues that are valued across cultures, like wisdom or courage. 
There are criteria of judgment derived from definitions and descriptions of specific genres and subgenres of movies, books, music, games, from the purpose they are supposed to fulfill. Some criteria of judgment seem quite obvious. Consider the claim, imitation is the highest form of flattery. Why imitation can be judged like that? Because it's more honest than mere praise. Furthermore, since words like good or bad relate to other properties, I think that it's more reasonable to focus on those properties instead of such vague judgments like good or bad. They can give something more concrete and objective to judge and compare, something that people may be more likely to agree on. And finally, regarding value judgments that come from personal preferences, what really matters is not what we think, but what we feel. People acquire standards of judgment from various sources, from their parents, their surroundings, their society, their culture, their own purely personal preferences, their own experience, during their childhood and throughout their lives, and they use them as their own because they care about them. And if they care about them enough, they might promote them, so more people will use them. After all, that's what many people do. They promote things that they care about, even knowing that their preference for it is subjective. And which standard is widely accepted depends in practice on who's more effective at promoting and spreading it and which standard appeals to most people. This is especially true in democracy. That's how it is in practice and that's how it will continue to be because in order to prevent that, one would have to somehow prevent people from expressing any value judgment about anything, which is obviously practically impossible. In the end, whether one judges other standards is a personal decision. One just have to remember that saying that something is good or bad is not particularly informative in itself without specifying what is hiding behind those words. When presenting examples of claims about the purpose of life and party morality, I've asked if the authors of those claims could be able to show that that's how it is in the universe. But maybe they could expect that those claims could be simply known and understood a priori, without any evidence, without any arguments. In order to answer that, I must present here several claims that the method described in this video is based on. Maybe you've noticed that I've been avoiding the word truth. I've avoided it wherever I could. That's because this word has been so used and abused for various purposes that sometimes one cannot even be certain what is meant by that word. Various philosophies, ideologies, religions created their own definitions of what truth is used the concept of truth for their own purposes, or even denied that there is such a thing as truth, to the point that the concept of truth is not something that enhances our understanding of things, but obscures it unreasonably and makes it more uncertain than it actually is. That's why I've decided that I will bypass this word, this unclear concept, and go lower to another concept which even the ability to define truth depends on, to a concept that in English language can be expressed with the word is. It's a basic concept that does not need to be defined with any other words. It's best to present it on examples. Let's look at several of them. 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 2 equals 5. Is it? No, it is not. This homeless has no home. Is that so? Yes, it is. Beer is truth. In those statements, the meaning of their terms alone can tell us with certainty if they say how it is. Another set of examples. This apple is bad. This apple has a bug hole. If the apple that has a bug hole is bad, then this apple is bad. If food that harms your health is bad, then unhealthy food is bad. If, as I've said before, words like good and bad say that the object fulfills or doesn't fulfill some specific claim, then statements like this is good and this is bad both at the same time can be saying how it is. But otherwise, they are not saying anything useful in themselves. The second and third claim can be saying how it is, and it's possible to verify with your senses if it is so. In the case of the claim about unhealthy food, it can be derived from its meaning that it says how it is. We know that unhealthy food is a food that harms your health, and this statement logically states that if food that harms your health is bad, then unhealthy food is bad. Another set of examples. I see that this water is in liquid form. This water is in liquid form. Is that water in liquid form? All the evidence suggests that it is. Roses have thorns, that's just how it is. I am imagining a tree. Whether those statements say how it is depends on the state of the world, the universe, of everything that exists, including our own mind, except language. Also included here are statements that speak about the past and, indirectly, statements that speak about the future. When speaking about the past, that what is are historical facts that we are trying to establish. 
when trying to predict what will happen in the future, unless we are guessing completely randomly, we are basing our predictions on our knowledge about what is. But how certain can we be how it is in the universe, outside of language itself? Well, it's a bit more complicated than it is with statements where the meaning of the terms alone defines what is. The only thing that you can be absolutely certain is what your senses tell you. If you see that the water is in liquid form, then you can be absolutely certain that it is what you see. But whether what you perceive with your senses is something that exists in the physical world, and whether the conclusions that you draw from what you perceive actually describe how it is in the universe, that's where it gets a bit more complicated and uncertain. But not so uncertain as some philosophers claim it is. There are various skeptical claims that what we perceive might not correspond to material reality at all, that everything we perceive might be a simulation, that only our own mind exists and what we perceive was created by it, that the universe might have been created just recently together with our memory and all the evidence of history and so on. There are claims that since we cannot really be sure that what we perceive is reality, then we cannot be sure of truth. That since people perceive the same things in different way, then everybody can have their own truth. Truth is socially constructed, or even that there is no such thing as truth. In the context of discovering what is, how it is, none of it creates any significant problems. Regardless of the nature of reality and the nature of our perception, for us there is always something about which we can say that that's how it is. And this something depends on two things. One is language, the other is everything else that exists in our mind. And that can be either anything created by our mind without our senses. If you are imagining a tree, then there is a tree in your imagination. Or anything perceived by our senses. And that brings us to another question. Since people rely only on their own perception, and even if we perceive the same world, then everything is filtered through subjective perception, then is it actually the case that everybody can reasonably make any claims that they want? What you see on these pictures are video games. It can be said that a video game contains its own world. A game world that has its own properties and is governed by its own rules. The player perceives the game world on the screen and through the speakers. The player interacts with this world through input devices such as mouse. These particular games that you see on the screen are multiplayer games that you can play through the internet and interact with other players in the game world. Game worlds of multiplayer games and how they are perceived by players have certain characteristics that are significant to us here. First, there is never total consistency between players. Factors such as internet speed, errors in the game code, flawed algorithms, badly written code, varied player's hardware, guarantee that what different players perceive will never be entirely the same at any moment. Second, the game world's properties and rules change. Game developers might release a patch that will significantly change some elements of the game, making the game world inconsistent in time. Does all of it mean that it's pointless to attempt to discover and describe some consistent properties of the game world, consistent rules that govern it, to discuss them with other players, to adapt to those rules while playing, to find what action is most effective in specific situations? Does it mean that every player can have their own truths about the game world, about its properties and its rules? Well, practice shows that no, it does not mean that. That's because of two things. First, in practice, rules are not being changed too often, so one does not have to constantly rediscover them, which would make playing the game rather pointless. Second, inconsistencies between what different players perceive are not significant enough to be able to reasonably claim that it's impossible for our players to come up with a consistent description of the game world. Despite the inconsistencies, individual players do not have their own versions of the game world with different properties and rules. Everyone is playing the same game, in the same game world, governed by rules that are independent of perception. Rules that can be and should be described and taken into account while playing. And precisely the same is the case with our perception. What we perceive is consistent. We perceive that there is consistency in properties of the perceived natural world and laws that govern it. There are regularities, specific non-random causes and consequences. It's not like, for example, fire burns your hand on one day and on another it makes it wet. And that's why we can live in this perceived world. Because in a world without such consistency, it would be rather hard or impossible to live. Not being certain of anything, not being able to predict anything, not being able to plan anything. What we perceive also has what I will call here a sufficient collectively perceived consistency. There is enough consistency between what various people perceive to allow us to conclude that it's ridiculous to say that people can make contradicting claims about the world and we should treat it as their own truth. 
Of course, people may differ wildly in their interpretation of what they perceive, which is the subject that I will return to later in the video, but the interpretation is based on a perception that is consistent between people, and that shows that there are properties, laws, regularities, causes and consequences that are independent of subjective perception of each individual. For example, everybody with healthy senses can perceive that right now there is no Soviet Union on Earth, and that this perception won't be changed by any worldview that includes beliefs according to which it should have been a prosperous state. And we can discover specific causes of why there is no Soviet Union anymore. There is also a sufficient collectively perceived consistency to be able to recognize when someone's senses are not healthy, so we don't have to take seriously someone who claims, for example, that there is no such thing as sound or that the sun is a cube. One can also conclude consistency in perception from the fact that humanity has survived, prospers and is where it is. If the differences in perception were that great, then human species would have not even been able to cooperate to survive, let alone to build a civilization. In order to cooperate, humans have to agree on something, and in order to survive in the natural environment, they have to interpret this environment sufficiently correctly. All of it is the case regardless of what it is that we perceive. Whether that what we call the world, the universe, nature, is an actual physical world, a simulation, a product of our own mind, or anything else. That is the case even if the world has been created a second ago together with our memory and historical records. From the very fact that there is a coherent history, one can derive existence of consistent laws, because without consistency there is no story, only random events, random causes and random consequences. Humans are constrained by those laws, by consistent causes and consequences, and have to understand them and take them into account when making decisions, when working to achieve their goals. Which brings us to another issue. What methods of discovering how it is offer strongest arguments in support of our claims? Those who offer the greatest perceived consistency, especially the greatest collectively perceived consistency. If I claim that the sun is not blue, everybody with functioning eyes can see that. And we can confirm every day if it's still not blue. There is consistency. But if someone claims that his intuition tells him that once every hundred years the sun becomes blue, then there is no consistency of perception, because intuition is totally subjective, and the intuition itself does not allow to see if once every hundred years the sun becomes blue. We will be able to verify it every hundred years, but not with intuition, but with our senses. Or if you claim that the economical system that you've designed will bring prosperity, but every country that implements it crumbles economically, then there is a clear perceived consistency. Regarding claims about what is in the external world, arguments that offer greatest consistency come from the senses, which should be obvious since, as I've already explained, to us the external world is basically what we perceive with the senses, regardless of what it actually is. If there is a sufficient consistency of perception between people, then we can reach common conclusion about how it is in the external world. Only if there was no such consistency, and everybody was perceiving completely different things, then it would have been rather hard to agree on how it is in the external world, and everybody would have their own external world. Since we are interested here only in the consistency of perception, then there is no regress problem. That is, we don't have to verify with some other method if the senses offer consistency, which then would require another method to verify if that method verified the senses correctly, which would require yet another method to verify the previous method, and so on to infinity. We perceive with the senses themselves if there is consistency of perception. In this context, senses are self-verifying. That's because we do not have to verify if they correctly represent something else, like an actual physical world but only if their presentation is consistent, and in practice that is enough, because as we also know from our senses, we are affected and constrained by what we perceive, regardless of whether what we perceive is actually a reality. Senses are not only the best method, but required. Even if you correctly concluded something about the external world without using the senses, then without the senses there is really no way to verify it, because without the senses, without sight, hearing, smell, taste and a touch, there is no external world for you. Lack of collectively perceived consistency offered by the senses is the reason why there are really no convincing arguments for claims about existence of objective goodness or for other metaphysical claims. In practice, the most successful of methods that involve the senses and provide consistency is the scientific method. 
is because it demands that the hypothesis must be tested in the external world according to a procedure, subjecting the hypothesis to the unbiased laws of nature which doesn't care what we think and expect, and it provides results that can be interpreted by other people, while also demanding that the tests could be repeated so other scientists could verify if the results can be replicated. But in practice, we do not have to verify everything with our own senses. Consistency can be indirect. That's why, for example, in matters that we are not familiar with, we refer to experts, or in general to people who know more than us. Because we know from experience that it's more probable that someone who knows more and is more experienced will be right than someone who knows less and is less experienced. Even intuition can be a good argument in support of a claim if it comes from an expert or from someone who is proven to be consistently correct. Anything can be the best argument if it's the best what you've got at the moment and you have to work with what you've got. In the case of analytic statements, consistency comes from understanding the statement and the terms contained in it. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Everybody who understands this statement can agree that that's how it is. In the case of value judgments that refer to a purpose of a specific object, consistency comes from purpose. When purpose is defined and accepted, then there can be an agreement that the specific thing is good if it fulfills its purpose. It is this consistency that is the reason why in general disagreements about value judgments that refer to purpose are relatively small compared to disagreements about value judgments that express personal preference. Here there is a significant lack of perceived consistency since preferences are not consistent between people, with the exception of cases where the preference is based on something that is common to most people, like biology or psychology, as I've explained before. In the light of all of this, I'm proposing here that truth should be defined simply as something that is, and the true statement is a statement that actually describes how it is. In the case of analytical statements, the truth is derived from the meaning of the statement. In the case of value judgments, statement like, if food that harms your health is bad, then unhealthy food is bad, is true or false because of its meaning. Statement like, if the apple that has a bug hole is bad, then this apple is bad, and the apple has a bug hole, can be true or false, and it depends on how it actually is in the world. If words like good or bad mean that the object fulfills or doesn't fulfill some specific prescriptive claim, then statement like the apple is bad can be true or false, but until we know what is hiding behind those words, then if such statement is true, is indeterminable. In the case of statements where truth is derived from their meaning, truth is always certain. In the case of other statements, it's not so obvious. What is certain is what your senses tell you. If you know that you are seeing a screen, then you can be certain that you are seeing a screen. Even if it's just a hallucination, you are seeing what you are seeing. The conclusions that we draw from what we are perceiving generally are not so certain. There is always a possibility that a new knowledge will show that our conclusions are more or less incorrect. Even science has been mistaken many times and had to adjust to new discoveries. But one area where there is a possibility of making statements that are certainly true is evidence. If all evidence shows that there is a star in the center of the solar system, then you can say with certainty that all evidence shows that there is a star in the center of the solar system. That's because evidence is based on perception and interpretation. We can be certain that what we are perceiving is what we are perceiving, and it's possible to correctly interpret what we are perceiving, so one can actually make a certainly correct argument if it pertains to evidence. So, let's assume that we've made a pluralistic prescriptive conditional claim and we've established that this claim contained in it is true. Does it automatically mean that we should do what this claim suggests if we want to achieve the given goal? Not necessarily. It depends on some other factors. The very first thing that we should consider, and it should actually be done before analyzing this claim, is what this goal is based on, because it may turn out that the goal itself is based on wrong analysis of the situation, on untrue is claims, and it should not be pursued in the first place. So you apply the same analysis of an is claim to the claims that the goal is based on. If the goal has a solid base, then we have to take into account that relationships between actions and consequences generally are not just the simple if-then relationships, but are more complicated, and we have to consider if other unwanted relationships are involved. If the action is against our other goal, or results in something that is against our other goal. An example of such relationship is prohibition that was introduced in the USA in the 1920. One of its many unintended consequences was the dramatic growth of wealth and power of the American Mafia, which then resulted in, among many things, the growth of corruption, 
because the mafia used their money to pay off government officials. If the goal itself is against our other goal, or results in something that is against our other goal. An example of such relationship are the attempts to contest British naval and colonial power initiated by German Kaiser Wilhelm II at the end of the 19th century. It resulted in the improvement of Anglo-French relations, which ended the diplomatic isolation of France. Isolation, which was mostly the result of the efforts of German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck to prevent France from attempting to take revenge for the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. If the action results in something that the next against our intended goal, and this something is sure or very likely to eventually defeat our goal and make the entire effort pointless. In colonial India, the British wanted to decrease the population of cobras and offered a reward for cobra corpses. Initially it was working, but the British basically created a demand for cobra corpses, so it created an incentive to supply cobra corpses and people started to breed cobras and basically selling them to the British. When the British realized it, they cancelled their reward. Then people released their cobras and in the end there was more cobras in India than before. Action A may also result in something that prevents us from achieving the goal even only temporarily. In this case, A does not cause B at all, and D's claim is false. An example would be raising taxes to increase budget revenues, but raising them too much and creating an incentive to avoid taxes, which in the end decreases the revenues. If the goal itself results in something that the next against it, and this something is sure or very likely to eventually defeat our goal and make the entire effort pointless. An example of it can be any flawed political, economical or other system that for a time seems to work but has built in flaws that in time will inevitably cause it to decline and collapse. This actually is a broader subject worthy of a separate video. After considering all of this, the next thing would be to consider if there are other more advantageous methods of achieving the goal. So let's summarize the steps of the method. Start with the pluralistic prescriptive conditional claim. It doesn't have to be precisely in this grammatical form. It doesn't have to be a single sentence. It doesn't even have to be spoken. It all depends on the specific situation. But it has to be realized. It has to be realized that people have different goals, resulting from different attitudes, desires, values, and so on. That's just how it is. And you should take that into account for your own good. You will have a rather hard time convincing others by simply claiming that your goal is the right one is the only correct one, is the truth, and other goals are simply wrong. You start looking for what's wrong in the next step. In the next step, you analyze if the goal itself is based on correct analysis of the situation, on true is claims. Then you analyze the is claim contained in the prescriptive claim. If the is claim is supported by convincing strong correct arguments, then you look for other causal relationships that need to be considered. Finally, you consider if there are other, more advantageous methods of achieving the intended goal. The last four steps can actually be done in various order, depending on the situation. However, there is a certain problem here. If you've seen the previous videos on this channel, then you should know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those characteristics of human reasoning, those psychological mechanisms like motivated reasoning, cognitive dissonance, cognitive biases like confirmation bias. Those are the things that make disagreement and uncertainty greater than they reasonably should be. There is a level of rational, reasonable disagreement and uncertainty. The evidence may be not fully clear, that what we are sure of now may later be overturned by new discoveries, but such mechanisms like motivated reasoning increase disagreement to unreasonable levels by making people deny even logically true statements and strong arguments that disconfirm what they are strongly convinced about and accept illogical statements and weak arguments that confirm what they are strongly convinced about. That's why I am claiming here that we should be teaching about those psychological mechanisms. Teaching in schools, at some relatively lower level of education, about such things like motivated reasoning, cognitive biases, cognitive dissonance, and also logical fallacies and other errors of reasoning and argumentation. I am claiming that it is necessary if you want to reduce disagreement and uncertainty to reasonable levels. Also, I'm claiming that if you want to have any chances of curbing this, let's call it, intellectual chaos that is progressing in recent times, then we should understand what I've described here in this video. And I intend to test those claims empirically, here on this channel, in the future videos, starting with the next one. Let's see what will happen.